Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of the Research Labs podcast. So far in the product series, we have been exploring product design, product management, and building a career into those fields. Today, we are going a little deeper into uh, an, a foundational aspect of product and UI UX design. Yes, you guessed it right from the title. It's design systems. And uh, so if you are someone who uses digital products, I think almost all of us, uh, if you are watching or listening right now, you're using one. So you will get to know what goes under the hood to build a seamless experience that you use. And if you are a product designer, you have to listen up because design systems are going to be an integral part of your workflow or are already a part of it. Today we have on the show, um, today's guest is a senior user experience designer from PayPal. And he says he obsesses over design systems and accessibility currently. Um, uh, he is a family man from Silicon Valley, California. And uh, an incredible fun fact, he has mentored more than 70 designers, 70 people so far to this date um, and is having some crazy impact in the community right now. So let's welcome on the show today, James Carlton. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. It's awesome to be here. Thank you, James, for joining us. And uh, how are you feeling? Good. Yeah, I'm excited. It's fun to you know find out about this and get the opportunity to talk about one of my favorite topics: <laughs> design systems. So it'll be cool. All right. Yeah, we're excited to hear from you today. Yeah. So before we go into design systems, take us on a tour of your product journey so far and how does it look like to live your life? <laughs> uh, oh, a quick journey. So, um, so I studied industrial design originally. I have, like growing up, I was always into different design aspects, art, you know, just being creative in general. And then I would just take apart things and see how they worked. So sort of had like this, you know, mechanical and artistic sides to me. Um, and so I ended up using that, you know, to go towards something that, um, you know, was in the design business, um, but was a little more, um, you know, hands on in industrial design, you know, hardware products. And it was fun, super challenging program, um, and learned a ton. Um, and then just, I had the chance to have just one class in, at that time, which was interaction design. And so it was like before UX was a big term. And uh, that's where I sort of said, wait, this thing is pretty cool. Like, not only um, can I think about, you know, the hardware stuff, but I can think about the screens and like how, what the whole experience is um, interacting with this thing. So I sort of, I think that sort of got me thinking about uh, products and sort of how design impacts products in that sense. Um, and then later I ended up, you know, freelancing um, for industrial design firm, but the economy sort of shifted and that didn't last as long as I wanted it to. So I, in the meantime, I was like freelancing or having some side work and just building websites and simple things like that. Um, and it sort of kept that spark alive that, you know, I want to do something digital, I want to do something, you know, online um, instead of the sort of the slower, more methodical process of making something out of hardware, you know, physical goods. So, um, that thread, I think, just continued, and eventually I got into a startup um, through a friend that, you know, where I was doing some really basic engineering. Like, I'm not an engineer, but <laughs> I was able to do some front end, you know, HTML, CSS, simple stuff for this company that needed help. And they needed help so badly, they're like, okay, well, we'll put you in this job. <laughs> um, and then, but the good thing about that is, like, I was on a creative team that involved user experience. And, I was in creative direction, and so I was able to see sort of how does that work in the real world. Um, 
not just on my own, but like, how does a team work together to produce, you know, uh, a user experience? And so that really opened my eyes. And I said, yeah, <laughs> I want to be in that position where I'm the one designing these things, not just making them um, happen in code. And that was much more my strength. So my next positions from there, I was able to, you know, focus on UX exclusively and um, sort of just sort of grow from there from that junior level. Um, and then a couple of companies later, now I'm specializing in design systems, as we'll talk about. And um, it's just, it's been really fun uh, to see how like these different areas of design can play with, with product. Thank you for your quick journey. And I'm sure that is a lot of years coming together in a concise way. Um, in terms of the fields that you mentioned that you switched, or I would say um, you thought that this would be better for me and you know this really aligns with me. Uh, what are the, um, from, um, from the time that internet launched, I think you've been almost working since that time into this field. What is the transitions of the different tools that you've seen or, uh, you know, you mentioned that you work with a lot of formats. So how is important is it to differentiate your thinking from the format and keep evolving as the times go by? Like you tried out development on your own, you tried out design systems, strategy. So how do you think for yourself in an evolving nature of the industry? Yeah, it's super. I mean, that's a perfect way to say it. it's always evolving. You know, it's moving fast. It's something that makes it exciting. But makes it challenging to you know like always trying out the new tools um and so yeah early i was just messing around with whatever i could you know it was it was simple code and eventually um you know started getting into some more specific uh, design software i was into 3d modeling for architecture for a while um, and then back into you know design through adobe products you know at the time photoshop those illustrator those things and then, you know, in terms of the UX journey, you know, we developed that, you know, um, those tools as well has changed so much. It's been awesome to see the growth there. Um, so, you know, I think the, the theme is like, just be adaptable and be curious. So I'm always testing out new tools. Um, and there's ones that I've been, that I haven't, you know, when you're sort of doing that side work or freelance exploration, you know, just working on your own side projects. You can sort of play with new tools without waiting for your company to sort of adopt them. And you can test them out and see how they work. So I've done a lot of that in the past. And then now I'm, I have a little bit of influence on what tools we use at the company so I can you know, make it more official. But I still play with stuff you know, on my own and see how it works and then think about, like, how could this work for my team? And can we propose this? So it's always like this, like you said, it's evolving. The tools are changing. Um, even just adopting the new features of a release of Figma or whatever tool you're using is always, you know, there's there's efficiencies um, and advantages to using those new features. So I just love, that's one of my topics is like just reading and watching anything about new design tools. So it's been a passion. Yeah, because tools will be transient and it will keep evolving as we um, grow in the industry, as we find new ways of working. And as we're recording this, Figma got acquired by Adobe. So what impact do you think has, because these were two separate tools, XD and Figma. So do you have a little something on that? Yeah, could do a whole episode on that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's a lot. I mean, I just like I mentioned, I was an Adobe user for a long time. Um, and then moving to Sketch, just like was so revolutionary that Sketch was focused on more UX and screen design than, you know, Photoshop, which was for photos. You know, and so it was, it's like these big breakthroughs. And now, and then Sketch added some, you know, design system features, but then Figma took to the next level. So um, in terms of UX, it's been really powerful. But then on top of that, for specifically design systems, it's been super powerful, just giving us the uh, tools to sort of um, help set up the standards and the reusable pieces. But I think, you know, I think you hinted at it earlier that, you know, you've got to be, able to sort of understand the design process and have that foundation and then you can sort of apply it to any tool and so yes i'm learning about new tools but i'm still using the same fundamentals of design um, no matter which tool i'm using and some tools will enable new processes like we didn't have you know shareable libraries before and so that opens up the whole workflow and we adopt 
uh, or adjust how we work because the tool enables us new things. So it's sort of a balance of going back and forth, you know, between like defining your own process and what the tools enable and how that modifies your process. So for Figma <laughs> specifically, like getting acquired, I think it could be great, it could be horrible. We've yet to see. It sounds like if you believe um, what Figma is saying that you know, they're still going to have some autonomy, and I hope that's true. Um, just because I love the way they've innovated quickly, and whenever a big company acquires, the fear is you know that innovation is going to slow down. Um, so we'll see. But I think there's if they paid that much for it, I think they understand the value and they don't want to ruin it. So hopefully that's true, and they'll sort of be influenced in reverse, and the bigger Adobe. Um, can learn. I didn't get real deep into Adobe's solution, which was XD. So I've just heard from others that it had some features, but also had some issues. Um, it wasn't as innovative as Figma has been. So if, if those two teams can sort of um, learn from each other, I think that'd be pretty cool. Um, one thing about Adobe, of course, is like they've got so much scale that they could multiply, you know, how, um, how many customers they could reach for Figma, things like that, you know can benefit the small team that Figma had. So I think <laughs> I'm optimistic usually with, with these things, but um, until they prove me wrong, I think it, hopefully it'll be good. Yeah, hopefully uh, there would be some osmosis in terms of team, the knowledge transfer, and we would the design community will see that soon. So thanks for sharing your early initial thoughts on that. And I believe you when you say that your tools should enable you and you should be the one thinking and making the decisions. And if a tool has some ideas that you can get from it, you should totally use that and incorporate that in your workflow and update that. Because why not? If it saves time, if it saves your effort, and if it make, makes the product better. So um, I think you should totally go for a specific tool. Connect to that thought. Um, you also don't want it to be limited by the tool too. So. You know, if a tool provides a new value, you can add it to your flow. But if there's something you know that you need and the tool is not providing, don't let that stop you. I think you know some people, or especially when I was early in my career, you met that attitude of, "Oh, the tool doesn't allow me to do that, so it's not important." But that's not always the case. <laughs> like there could be a part of your process that you should do. You, know, you might have to do more manually. You might have to spend more time on it, but it's worth it because the end result of your design work will be better. An example could be like Figma has some basic prototyping, but it doesn't do advanced prototyping. So if your project could really benefit from that, like high fidelity um, interactive prototyping, then use a tool for that. You know, add it on to your workflow. Even though Figma is you know is your day to day product, you know, or Sketch, whichever you're using these days, um, you know, you can add other other parts to your flow because it, what matters, you know, is um, the quality of your of your design work, and so don't be limited by the tool at the same time. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. And now, if we um, open up the design systems discussion, um, before I ask you more, I think we could share with the audience that what are design systems, and why, in the first place, do we use them in design teams? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's good. I mean, you'll get different definitions from different people. Um, you know, it's a growing industry, but it's still sort of spongy and, you know, people will use the terms in different ways. Um, I think of it as, you know, at the basic level of design system, just sort of this method to organize all the elements of your UI um, so that your, your user experience of whatever digital product you're working on, you know, is, is improved. And so um, it's sort of like <laughs> if you're in a team and it, things start to get messy, that's when you're like, wait a second, you know, something that could help us is this thing I've heard about, design systems. And the reason it gets messy is just sort of the natural way designers work. Um, you know, if if you have one designer and you're, you know, a small startup or something, or you're on your own, it's pretty simple to keep yourself organized. You know, you can, you can have your own, um, you know all the screens and whatever this product is, and you know all the patent design decisions you've made. But as soon as you add someone else to that process, like, They've got to learn what decisions you made. And then you add a third person and it just gets more and more complex as it scales. So design systems is sort of the current best way to deal with that um, scaling of designers. Um, and so um, I think of like, why would you do this? And you know, 
One I just touched on, which is scale. You know, as soon as your design team gets bigger, it helps um, organize things. Um, another one is like it can, when it's implemented, there's sort of the, the internal and external sides of this. There's, you know, for your team, you get that communication, you get some efficiency. So say you've designed a button on one screen and you want to put it on the other screen. You know, you can just use that same exact button. But there's also benefit on the external side because now the customer sees the same button on both pages. And that's a super simple example we always talk about. Um, but it, it can apply to lots of different design patterns, you know, pieces of the interface, whether it's a, a sign-up form for onboarding, you know, whether it's like the navigation menu, um, a, a big data table with lots of information. It can be these different patterns. But all any any time we you know, are more consistent, that benefits the user, the end customers, benefits the company, um, and benefits sort of how you represent your brand too. Because if you're if each designer sort of has their own flavor of their work. Um, you know, it's going to dilute the message that your brand or your product experience is trying to communicate to the customer. So setting some standards for that is sort of what the design system can do. Um, and yeah, so that's how, how, sorry, excuse me, that's how I sort of think of it and summarize it. But um, there's a lot more behind the scenes that happens, especially as your design system effort grows. Yeah. Would it be fair to assume that if the design system grows or if the design team is growing, um, this design system would also need to grow, and the product is also growing. Like the a uh, lot of features are being added. Uh, users are requesting new and new modules, or there are different parts in the product that are being used. Like, um, and it has turned into like uh, turned into a challenge for design systems to organize its, itself through designers. So would it be fair to assume that the product is also growing and scaling when the design teams are scaling? Like if the product is performing well in the market, um, it would be the designers we need to work faster and it would be more helpful if they are more organized in terms of the design system. Yeah, definitely. And I think um, the product you know, manager or owner, uh, those positions sort of get overlooked sometimes when we talk about design systems. but you're right that like, in a product-driven company you know, where you're delivering quickly, as you mentioned, um, you know, that's super foundational. The, the designers can't just have the system that they use alone. It has to be, to make it a system, You know, I consider it a system once you add code library to it. So it's not just designers getting organized, it's engineers getting organized. And the way that those two coordinate is with a partnership with products. So the product should drive um, what the design system does. Because I've seen this go wrong where you're, you're sort of setting up a design system and you say, oh, here's the 10 typical patterns that um, designers use. Let's just make the system about those. But then you're disconnecting it from the product. You're not like, instead, I think you should set it up based on what the product needs. So if you're starting out the system, say, what is the product using today? Oh, we have these forms. You know, we have these segmented controllers, you know, whatever the case may be, and build it off of that. And then you can add those other um, like industry standard uh, pieces later if you need them. But I wouldn't just start and say, before we can do anything, we need to design 20 patterns and make sure we have everything that material design has. Instead, you should focus on, you know, what does your product need? And so that's why that collaboration between engineering product and design is so important for the design system. Um, because I think you could be, you could waste a lot of time and, and value, you know, at the company uh, resources if you're not, you know, tailoring the system to the specific product. And even though there's sort of a feel that things are standardized in the design world, like, oh yeah, I could just grab this kit and you reuse everything. It's, ideally, it should be tailored to your product, you know, and there, that's where the value, where design can be more powerful if it's actually, you know, customized. Of course, there's standards, like we don't want to make a radio button look completely different than, than it has for 20 years. But um, there might be areas where you want to innovate something new, you want to have a new feature. And so you want the design system to be flexible enough um, to allow for that in terms of what the product wants to do. Right. Yeah, I was actually going to ask uh, if someone's building, wants to build a design system from scratch, what elements do they start with? What are the most important ones to include and what are like good to haves? And uh, what are the ones that you found uh, are very important in the design system, in in your company, in your freelancing work? 
um so which you i think quite quite rightly answered that it depends on the product what the product needs if the product needs a form and like the input needs to be organized then you don't need to go for the buttons let's say for example uh if the product is more into the uh let's say checklists or radio buttons go for that go for organizing that making that experience better in the design system so uh, are you saying that by by suggesting that? yeah yeah I, i like that and it's sort of a balance though you know you want to sort of go for you do want to set up standards like um and if you read about design systems there's this um, approach called atomic atomic design systems um where you know you get the little pieces or the atoms and then you add those atoms together to make bigger things so say you have you know your typography and you have your colors and you put those together to make a button now you have a button there's a molecule or whatever so it's this idea where you you build these building blocks and then you can put them together so in your example you know if if your product has you know, a lot of onboarding or or input screens where the customers giving you information then it's going to make sense to focus on those form fields and what happens when there's an error in the fi- in the form fields and is there um tool tips or like what are the other related components that you need for that that experience um but then you also need sort of that foundation which is the typography which is your spacing you know which is your page grid so it's a bit of both you know i said it should be custom to your product needs but um to get to um an efficient system you've got to have those basics as well so um yeah those fundamentals of sort of visual design and layout and interaction design you know thinking about hover states on web and thinking about tap targets on mobile you know those are all part of the foundations you need to set up in your design system of course yeah yeah mm-hmm. and then it's the other point that is just like this is always an evolving thing like you can't think of a design system as we're going to do it for 6 months and then it'll be done <laughs> because as your product you know grows um and evolves you know even if it's um you know even if there like so there's these efforts that come down typically you know, like a a big redesign like the branding will change and so your company now has a new logo and has new colors so that'll impact the design or they open up new fe- a suite of features and you want to say you know what what components do we need for this So there's all these different inputs to the design system and you want to keep it fresh. You know, because it's this tool that used by different people like it's got to be well maintained. It's this living system that needs the care and the maintenance to keep it going. So if you get to a point where you know you've got and we talk about this as adoption where like in a, in a big company like ours, we have a small team that's building the system and then we're trying to get the other teams to adopt it. And so we talk about that word, but it's really about like what do they need and what is the company moving towards for example if there's a new logo you know then we'll design the system to support that logo and the colors will apply from the brand direction down to the buttons and the form field so all these things get influenced by it and so that takes the ongoing work you know so that's why it's like never done because those influences are always happening and it could also be outside it could be that you know it could be that google introduced a new feature on android phones and you want to support that so your design system needs to reflect that So there's lots of little factors that come in that you know keep it uh, an ongoing project not just like this this um thing you finish at the beginning of your startup and then you're done with it. And then that sort of gets into like staffing and how you support design systems which is a big topic too. You know sometimes at small companies maybe the same person doing the user experience is also keeping some patterns over here and calling it a pattern library. or design system and then as you grow you might have dedicated people like we do you know setting up a team that's just doing design systems every day so would it i think when you are building a when your team works on the design system like your user is actually the design team that will use it since you talked about adoption so you would need to communicate with them that hey we are you know trying to introduce this what do you think about it do you do that do you have communication with that team who will actually be using it and educate them about you know here is what we thought and there's proper documentation for that i'm sure um so how does that look like like it should be very transparent amongst the team and also amongst the broader user base customers as we call it yes for sure and um i think that's another you know scale topic when you get to this point you know where you have 
dedicated people. Now, um, what we did is we, we created a product team. So the design system is sort of its own product, just like the external customer facing product team. So maybe we have an app is for a certain segment of people. So we'll build a product team around that. And so now our design system team is treated similarly in the structure of the company where you know, we have the same kind of um, contributors, you know, engin dedicated engineers, product people, planning staff, um, and designers. And so we're all working in like a, a pod together where we're making decisions together. And so you're right, like our customers now with that setup are not the external customers, like you know, in the public, it's the internal teams. And so, yes, our communication has to be for them, our deliveries have to be for them, our goals have to be for what we're providing those users. Of course, we're keeping the track of the external customers as well, because you know, if we're not designing for them, <laughs> you know, we could get off track. But but yeah, in terms of our structure and our communication, it's all, you know, us sort of as a service team. Um, although we don't have an agency model, you know, in that sense, but we have sort of a product mo team model. But yeah, the internal people are our stakeholders. So we're always doing research. If we do research, it's on those people inside. So we're asking other designers, other engineers, other product managers to be our subjects for, you know, how is the system working, getting the feedback from them, and then how could we improve? So it's just like the typical UX process. It's just like inside the company um, in that sense, because our customers, like you said, are those tools, teams that are using the tools that we're producing. And so if we're producing design tools and engineering tools, those are our customers that are using them. And like you said, adoption. Um, one thing that really has surprised me over the time is like how much of our job is that communication. You know, you mentioned, you know, setting up the, um, the system is one thing. You have to document it as part of the communication. You have to have office hours to help explain it. You have to have these meetings that we have, you know, quite often about, hey, here's the new features of our design system. And here's a new feature from Figma or whatever tool. And so we're doing a lot of that, and I've really grown to love that part of it, of the job. You know, it's less of the traditional UX role, but it's like this education side of it where we're teaching. And so when new people come on the design team, and we have a pretty big design team, a couple hundred, you know, we get a lot of new hires. And so we have to set up and say, hey, welcome to the company. Here's the design system. Here's the right way to use it. You know, here's how we want to be collaborative. We don't want to be the design police, you know, but we want you to interact with us on the Slack channels or office hours. And so there's a lot of communication back and forth to keep the system connected to what the what the our internal customers need, those designers and product people and engineers. Um, and I really have gotten to like that part and spend a lot of my day in Slack just answering questions about the design system or suggesting patterns that we already have. You know, because designers will say, "Oh, what about this pattern? You know, do you have? You don't have it." Well, actually, we made a decision not to have that one because we think this pattern over here will work better. And so there's a lot of that communication and education built into the job now that we're at this scale you know at smaller scales you know it'll be different but that's sort of our experience at this level wow i actually got a visual of how it would look like to work with you and as as a designer um and hundreds of designers as you said um so do engineers work with the design system do they contribute do they use it yeah, so I think that's what starts to make it powerful. Um, I sort of treat it, you know, when you're at the early stages of a design system, it's more of a pattern library because it's just design patterns that are reusable. And that's good. It's definitely where you start. I think when it becomes a powerful system is when you add engineering libraries. And so because that gives you the ability to say, okay, as a design system team, we have this button and we also have this button in code that matches perfectly and it functions exactly as designed. And so that becomes really powerful, like the reuse on the design side and the reuse on the engineering side. So yeah, when as we built our team, you know, we had a few designers, and when we brought in our first engineer, like that sort of unlocked a whole, <laughs> a whole new superpower. And so since then, we've we now have more engineers than designers. You know, it's sort of flipped over time because we're supporting multiple platforms. You know, we have um, web and React, we have iOS and Android, and so as these um, platforms build more and more engineering on those it's become a huge part of our team so for sure and i think that that really is where the power is so now you know like i said earlier if, if something comes from the brand team or design leadership and they're like we're doing this new thing or product leadership and say we need this new feature 
now we say, okay, let's get that into the design system quickly so that it makes the job easier for the engineers and the designers who are internal customers that need to apply those new things. So, and it also drives adoption. So if we have the latest and greatest, that is a motivation for teams to use our system instead of building it themselves. Um, it saves them time. It can save um, the company resources. So I think over time, we've sort of proven our value to the bigger company. And like at the beginning, it's sort of scrappy. And it's like, well, why do we need a design system? I don't understand it. You know, we're fine on our own. We're doing our own thing. Like we don't need the design system. But now we're to a point where like leadership understands it and is directing people to use our system. And these bigger efforts, like when things change visually, you know, it's applied to the design system first makes it a lot more efficient and um, motivates those teams to work with us and um, help us evolve it and share their use cases. And so that's sort of the day-to-day now is, you know, updating the system and evolving those patterns. Also, you know, our, our design, the designers on my team are spending a lot of time aligning. So where we say, you know, we've got multiple teams. And so this person over here is designing an onboarding form and they're, they have a thing where you have to text a code to yourself and verify your identity, those kind of things. But then we hear someone over here in this like way other department doing the same thing, you know. And so we like to take that opportunity and say, okay, let's look at those together. Let's do some alignment and say those can be similar, even if your requirements are slightly different. Let's match up as much as we can between those two product experiences. And so that's a, that's another big thing we're doing now, sort of evolving the patterns and aligning different groups' experiences. And then, you know, ongoing is sort of that engineering collaboration because anything we design, we want to have it ready for engineers to use um, soon after. So we're always like in the weeds with our team designers, making sure the quality of those pieces is is really high and it's really valuable to those, to our internal customers. Okay. And uh, does it also ever happen that someone comes up with a new, like, Based on the feature request, someone comes up with this idea and then it is incorporated in the design system. Whereas going from, like you mentioned, that it would be first added in the design system and then used. Whereas I think in a case of ideas, they just come and then you have to find a way to organize them. So has it happened with you? Yeah, that's a great point. Great question. Yeah, and that does. I and mean, we, ha- we do it sort of two ways, like, you, like I mentioned earlier, if it's coming from leadership or a product requirement. Um, and then it's also coming sort of bottoms up, which is, like you said, a team is like hands on on a product and it's, it's different than our other products. And so they, they're exploring new things. We definitely don't want, and so you'll hear this from different people about design systems. Like we, the goal of design systems is not to squash innovation and take all the fun out of design, you know, and say, Oh, designers can't be creative. That's not it at all. Like the point of the design system is to make the repeatable pieces you know, predictable. You can grab those and use those. But that, that should open you up to spend more time innovating, more time designing for your specific experience. So ideally, you know, if we have this right balance of we're not the design police enforcing, like you can't do something new, you know, instead we're like, oh, that's pretty interesting that you're doing something new. Like how can we, how can other teams use that thing that you just designed, you know, and can we bring that into the system? Or, or we might say, can you test that for us and give us the research so that we know that that's successful? Then we'll bring it into the design system. So yeah, there's a, there's a great, relationship there and i try to um, foster that in slack and these different touch points that we have with our customers where it's not about telling you to stop doing that or limiting your freedom you know it's about finding what's right for the product and then if, if it, it's working well and even if it works better than what we already have you know we welcome those changes and we want to evolve it like i said earlier it's a living system you've got to keep maintaining it and keeping it fresh and relevant and that's that's for sure a way we do that um, and so we sort of have like a draft process where yeah, we have these patterns and we'll, we'll test them out with certain teams and sort of evaluate them before we bring them into, you know, the main system. Um, but we do want, we want that contribution. That's part of design systems. It's got to be that collaborative process between whoever's maintaining the system and who's using the system. It's got to have that give and take. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, so you more, more so facilitate a lot of collaboration and contribution to the idea is to help the design system grow and help the larger uh, company grow and uh, do uh, are your teams like uh, distributed or is it like a centralized approach to the design system or is it 
based on different cultures will have different elements. There might be some cultural nuances. Um, I'm not sure if you can give some examples, but is it uh, does it flow centrally, or it's like there will be a standard system overall globally, um, since PayPal mm-hmm. is this global product, and then there will be some uh, regional nuances to the design system, and hence the product itself. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good topic. Um, just generally, I can say <laughs> we we do have a sort of a global approach to it. Um, and like you said, we have some regional differences. So, um, you know, when we when you enter a certain market you know, in, a, in a geography, we'll definitely look at, you know, where we need translation, um, the sort of product strategy, but the design system wants to support that. So, like from the from early in, in as we set up our forms, for examples, if you know RTL languages, you know right to left where the the characters go the opposite way is English. Um, you know we we set up that support early into our system, so each of our components will design you know for standard Latin characters left to right, but or right to left, and then we'll also mock up the one next to it for the op, for the RTL languages. And so we try to keep that in the system you know as we go, and then that helps. Um, so there's that aspect of it. Um, there's a translation and thinking about um, like text strings. Like if you have a button and it has a max characters of you know 30 characters, like that's just, if we write that guideline, we have to make sure. Well, that's just that work in languages that where it's more verbose, has more letters in the words, um, and so we ha- we do have to think globally. Um, and that, I think that's a growth area for us. We definitely don't do it perfectly, um, but try to bring we try to cover those things where we can and um, when the product you know has specific needs for a certain geography yeah then we definitely dive in and make sure you know what we're providing is either you know has the base foundation and then they modify it or we can make the foundation flexible enough to support you know those those changes that are specific to different countries um but yeah that's that's an interesting topic on itself yeah 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 that that would require some research or you know hiring people from the, that locality or region to you know get more insight into what it would be like to serve these customers so that's great thank you yeah and i think you know in some areas companies will do that in other areas companies will say you know well we're us focused first and so they just sort of they don't treat those users as well as they should you know they're just sort of forcing them to understand the language uh, that they're not familiar with. So I think ideally, you know, um, those companies would be more inclusive in that sense and say, if we're going to invest in this location, like we should invest, like you said, in um, higher local um, language um, staff so that they can provide the right feedback on, you know, what it should say. The right uh, content, of course, is the first step of that, you know, in terms of language. But then in terms of the design patterns too, there's different you know, design patterns in different parts of the world. So the, um, ideally, yeah, we would we would jump in and, and get really specific per geo. Right, right. Um, uh, I think we talked about uh, engineering teams using design systems. I would like to talk about the libraries that are available. Since you also did uh, also you know understand development a little bit uh, and have worked with it. Uh, so, uh, how do libraries? So this is to someone who is building an MVP. Let's say. If they're using certain libraries like Bootstrap, let's say, uh, it really helps them to have a neat and clean design system at hand to use the components available to get the product to market fast. Um, and but then uh, it's so popular that like someone like us can figure that hey, this is Bootstrap that is being used if it's not branded well on the layer. <laughs> we can see. <laughs> so, what do you think of that trade-off? That using libraries versus like a branded design system, and you know that is built from scratch for the product itself. Yeah, no, it's a great question. I think it's it really depends on um, sort of your size and your goals uh, for the product. Um, I think using something off the shelf like that, um, th- the example that comes up, you know, Bootstrap or Material Design. Where there's this great, you know, they've invested lots of money and design time into creating those, um, and so they are a good foundation. Um, I think there's a point where you reach, uh, and I think it'll just show up. Like if if you have a startup and you know you've 
you start on Bootstrap and you say you've got a couple of years of work in and your product now starts to add new features, you'll just it'll come out of the seams and you'll start to see, wait, this part isn't working for us. You know, and this over here is we have to customize. And you start to see all the customizations you make and you're like, wait a second, you know, we're at this point now where this off the shelf, you know, tool, which was great at the beginning, is now, you know, sort of um, being stretched, you know, too far. I think that's where you sort of have to make the decision, say, okay, we can keep that foundation, but we're now going to, from going forward, we're going to start customizing. Um, so yeah, I think they can be a great accelerator. I'm not saying, you know, don't try those out. Um, it just sort of depends on, you know, the where your product is going and how different it is. Like you said, you don't want your product to just keep looking like the, the standard template forever, you know, especially as you grow, you know, the more users that they're, they're going to, they're going to lose that brand identity. If you're, if your product doesn't feel special, it doesn't feel like your brand. It just feels like this your more generic app. Um, that's gonna your product's gonna suffer in terms of the user experience. So, yeah, I think there's sort of some strategy there on when you use those and when you're you invest in sort of customizing or moving off on your own. But we still like even when we're big, you know, you still use pieces of that. Like there's some industry standards in there, like. Um, bootstrap grids and the way it deals with browsers on the web those can be super powerful um, as influence of what we do at bigger scales as well so y- you always and sort of the principle of a design system is it's a reusable library so you don't want to get away from that and say like everything we do is custom you still want to have that spirit of reuse and efficiency in the design system it just might not be directly related to those original um you know, product uh, templates like that. But yeah, for especially in the early stages, you know, I at the time that I was in smaller companies, I wasn't using design systems. So my experience has been, you know, in more larger companies um, with design systems. But yeah, I could totally see, I and mean, I've talked to people um, through mentoring about, you know, how they could start off in small situations or even being consultants where they, they go into a company as a consultant and they set up a design system. And so in those cases, yeah, those, those, um, off the shelf um, systems and code libraries can be really helpful as like a jump start. Uh, yeah, I think that's a pretty, you know, the trade off that you explained that you have to decide when you want to, when you can start investing in the custom design system while also learning from the, uh, from these uh, grand design systems, if you will. And these are really open source. So, um, and they have built it so well that. Actually, I learned a lot from these design systems while starting out that, you know, you can get some ideas of how you can, how your design system can look like, what parts you need, and you can plan your design systems based on the, these, uh, foundational ones that are available and that are widely used. Mm-hmm. That reminds me, um, another thing I like about sort of the design system business is, a lot of companies share what they're doing, you know, so there's a lot to learn from, you know, like Salesforce was one of those companies early in the design systems, probably 10 years ago, they're starting to share, you know, what they were doing with design systems and how they're, which patterns they have. So you can go to their public website and see, you know, how do they treat, you know, um, drop downs or how do they treat navigational items? And it's all there. It's like open for you to learn from. So I think that's great. Like there's so much sharing and um, cross collaboration in that sense. Where um, instead of being proprietary about these things, and it's, it's like there's sort of an openness in the in the community, which I like, sort of that open source feeling, where you know, can learn from other design systems and see how did they solve it. Um, and so for us, we'll look at those, you know, quite often. Um, it's not like copy and paste, but it's like, okay, how did they address it? You know, what were their requirements? And maybe our requirements are slightly different, so we'll make adjustments. But um, we love being, you know, influenced by what's working in other companies and what's not. You mentioned that you observe through mentoring. So you have obviously mentored a lot of people, according to me. So <laughs> that number sounds high. When someone will listen, uh, what that will be. Um, so definitely having some impact. Uh, what has been your observation about? So do you mentor designers in general or developers also? or? general people in the product community right um what has been your observation that we can learn like you have some really like profound insight here i feel so would you like to share some of it (laughs) yeah it's been really cool i think um i've sort of always been 
had the attitude that, um, you know, whenever I learn something on the team, I want to pass that on. So um, there's been a few ways that's come out. Like when if someone joins our team, I'm always jumping in and saying, "Okay, here's here's what we do." I start to you know onboard them as a team member, and so that's sort of like a type of mentoring um, that I started off with. And then you know we had a, opportunities to have interns and start to help mentor the interns, and so it sort of sort of built this habit where like I really enjoyed sort of explaining like how how our process works and how someone can jump in and contribute and seeing how they grow. And so, and because I think personally I've gone through so many different, like <laughs> I did not have a straight line. Like I went to school for this and I ended up doing this exact thing. You know, my career has been all over the place in a sense. And so, and I know a lot of other designers like that where, you know, they switch careers or they, they discovered UX later, or they find out they want to be you know, a product person, not a designer, or they want to do UX research, you know, whatever it is. Like, I think it's really important that we're all like, supporting each other in that sense. And that's why I like mentoring um, because we can just share each other's perspectives or I'm not going to, I'm never going to have like do these five steps to be successful in your life. Like I'm not that kind of mentor. I'm not a good life coach, <laughs> but I can, we can talk about the topics and be like, okay, you know, you're at this challenge where, you know, you're on a team and you don't feel like you're getting, you're, you're learning, you know, you're, you feel sort of stuck. And so I can, I've been in those situations. I can tell them. So it's just about sharing, you know, sort of some strategies and giving them encouragement and um, some confidence too. Sometimes you, people just need a little bit of confidence to move to the next step. So um, I like doing that a lot. And I was able to do that through the company. Like we had this little program um, through during the pandemic where a lot of people, designers were losing their jobs. And so we set up some time to talk to them. Um, and then I, later I found out about um, the current platform I'm using ADP lists. Um, if you haven't seen, it's just it's a great um, system where you know anyone can sign up to mentor. They just block part of my calendar, so that number sounds high, but it's it doesn't mean I've <laughs> mentored their whole life. But I've given I've given time to each of those people and try to sort of find out um, on the fly sort of how I can encourage them, how I can help them. Um, so it's been really rewarding, and I gave a talk recently about sort of what that's the benefits that's sort of provided because it, um, the more you do this sort of practice and mentoring, the more I think it builds up leadership skills. You know, you're able to jump in and say, evaluate a candidate quickly, um, which can be helpful for hiring. You're able to see, you know, how is this person stuck? You know, is there a way I can encourage them past that block, whatever it is? Um, can I inspire them? Those are all things I think leaders need to have experience doing. So it's been really fun. Um, and it's, it's just and the other aspect is sort of fun. Like you don't have to go anywhere. Like it's just like work from home culture because you know, we're just doing these video calls with people and I'm meeting people without going anywhere. I'm meeting people across the world. And so that's been really fun too. It's crazy, isn't it? Um, yeah. And I think what, what have you learned about people in general that you didn't know, like before getting on these calls, let's say. Um, yeah. What, I mean, I think it's, um, I think I'm always, <laughs> no, it's interesting. Like, I'm always thinking about, like, um, we have a lot of conversations with people and, and I think I've learned just sort of how different, um, people come into UX and how like, I'm trying to emphasize with them, you know, telling your story, um, because I've been in the hiring process and we get these, you know, applications or portfolios and they all look the same. Just like you said with Bootstrap, like where you can see, you know, see the design systems match. You can also do that on portfolios. You're like, okay, you all use WordPress or you all used Squarespace. Like I could, because I can tell it's the same, you know? So I tell them, you know, let's, how can you stand out? Like make sure your personality is coming through. And so I think what I've learned is like trying to figure out how to encourage them to be themselves um, and add their personality. We don't just want to hire a robot that knows user experience. Like we want to hire a person and what is, what are you about? And try to translate that. You know, what are you passionate about? Not just, I did this project at my design school or my boot camp, and here's the beginning, middle, and end. It's more like, what's the story of your career? You know, what have you grown in? Um, where do you think you've made an impact? Where, you, where do you want to go next? Like, all those things are what I want to see when I'm looking at candidates. So I think that's the thing that I've been trying to emphasize, and it's been tricky to try to figure out how to, how to encourage people towards that, but um, that's been fun to learn. Like, each person's, um, 
you know, background and personality. And it's a short amount of time. You know, I'm only meeting them with them for a few minutes. So I don't know their whole life by the end, but I try to get like a piece of it and say, you know, this piece that you talked about, you know, where you really love, um, you know, this particular topic or you love um, user research, you know, you should talk more about that in your portfolio. So those kind of examples. Exactly. Right. I, I think like connecting the dots for yourself to build your own story and sort of, uh, Circling back to your story, I think, how what are some like lessons that you've learned that, uh, or mental models that you've built for yourself that you know, hey, this is what I think, and if X situation arises, I'll do Y, or this is how I think. Like some certain mental models that you would like to share. Yeah, I, th- I mean, it, this one sort of career related, related, um, because I've been thinking about it with my mentors, but. Um, it comes to mind is like defining your goals. Um, this was hard for me as like a introvert sort of um, personality where I love to contribute, but you know I don't want to. I sort of had this block where I wasn't leading myself you know, in a sense. So I think that's, that's something I've had to learn the hard way is um, don't wait for your managers or um, your lead your teammates to sort of tell you what you should be next. Like you need to define what you want in your career. And in your life in general, but specifically to career and start setting up those goals. And then your managers, um, you know, if they're good, if they're, if they're invested in you, they will help you get to those, but they're not going to give you all the answers. So when you come in early into your career, you know, make sure you have sort of that, that vision set for yourself. Um, and it needs to be refreshed. It's not something you do once and you're like, okay, in 10 years, I'm going to be the CEO. You know, you're going to evolve. You're going to like recently I was. I've been learning a lot more about accessibility and so I start to look into that area. You know, maybe that's a future career choice or maybe it's just something that I want to add on to my current job. And so there's always things like I think can be really powerful. Like if you start to think about yourself as that story, you know, and as a product, like what features do you have? <laughs> I guess. So it's like, and which ones do you want to have next? You know, um, so, and then that runs into another one that I've done, which is I've sort of learned that, um, You've got to do more than you're asked. Um, like that example, um, the whole reason I'm in design systems is because I saw a need for it, and I saw that you know our design team needed to start repeating things, and we were getting fragmented. And so I said, "Hey, let's talk about sharing patterns." And so we set up a file that was like repeatable pieces, and the sort of a pattern library at that point. And so that was just self-initiated. You know, and then I talked to my coworkers about it. And they're like, "Oh, that's that's a good idea." I had a similar idea. It wasn't like I invented it. It was just like I just sort of acted on it first. And they said, "Yeah, that'd be great." So then we started to build a design system, and so that's how these things can happen. And then it becomes a supported team on your company or whatever the future you know evolution is. But that's like one example where I tell people, especially early in their career, look for you know what's your team missing? Is your team missing someone who's really good at discovery or? Is really good at design details, you know, in QA with engineers, and just sort of fill that role, and then you can talk about your lead to your leaders about it and say, you know, should this be a more official um, part of my job, or you know, should you just keep doing it on the side as sort of a supplement? But just looking for those opportunities where you can contribute in new ways um, beyond your basic, you know, job description. I think that's key um, because it can lead to new things, you know, and it can provide show that your employers, you know, that you're willing, you know, to go above and beyond um, in certain areas. So you sort of intuitively discovered the need to build design systems and you're working on it. So is, that's that's great. That's great. Yeah, I mean, that's one example. And there's more, you know, where like, as the industry changes, we talked about tools earlier. Maybe you're the, you're the person on the team that loves to try new tools. And so you become a resource for the rest of the team because they can come to you and say, how do you use this new tool or what tool should we use? So yeah, there's lots of ways to do that, you know, but just sort of have the attitude of, you know, I can go be become an expert or I can become passionate about this topic, even though, you know, my boss didn't tell me exactly this is part of my job. Um, but it's adding value to your team. You know, the more you can provide value to your team, the better. It doesn't have to be specific to your of course you still want to do your your day to day projects well and you can excel at those, of course, but Look for these opportunities, I think is what I tell people. And that's just been a lesson that I learned over time. 
yeah that's that's great to be able to think on your feet and take action even if you don't see the immediate return like the idea is to see what happens and let it lead that the idea lead you forward so you never know what you end up with that's great yeah um last question i think what excites you about the future what are you planning <laughs> yeah i just said i should I was just talking about defining your future. <laughs> yeah, um, but it's like I said, it's ongoing. So I'm, you know, I'm going through the season right now, you know, where I'm looking at those again, starting to think about, you know, what is the next position I want to get into, you know. So it's sort of like this personal evaluation that I need to do, and there's definitely things that are interesting. I mean, design system is still something I really like, but I'm starting to look at, you know, what are the things related to that? Um, what are the, you know, areas that we're not doing how is research in back to the design system. I think that's a really interesting um, aspect that we're not doing enough of. Um, how, another one I mentioned already, accessibility. Like, how can we build in the foundations of accessibility? Um, not just because, you know, it's, it's the right thing to do for the company. and It reduces our legal risk, but it's actually a better thing to do in terms of inclusion, and making sure um, customers were more inclusive to different types of customers. Um, so that one's really been been. Um, my focus lately, and I can. You know, looking forward, I definitely want to dig into that more. I start to think about, you know, not only do we make sure our color buttons have the right color contrast, that's sort of like the baseline accessibility, but you know, how are we working with um, assistive technologies? You know, how we're looking at how does the system and the product respond you know, to these different user needs? And how does inclusion go beyond that? We're also talking um, about other aspects of inclusion, and. Um, in our customer base. So those topics have really gotten me thinking um, both in the design system and beyond because, you know, it can, it can get into your hiring practices. Like, are you hiring people with um, disabilities? Are you hiring people with um, different representations? You know, and so if your team is representative of a large um, cross section, you know, of, of people, then you'll have this more, a wider perspective and you're, you could benefit your end work. So there's a lot I'm thinking about on that end and sort of like how um, how should that look in terms of our design team? Like how does that evolve the typical UX process? All those things um, I think have been on my mind lately looking forward. So that, that's sort of a touch on it, but yeah, there's plenty to think about. And, and then things like this, I'm trying to like learn how to... Um, be more of a public speaker and practice those skills as well. So it's been fun. Well, yeah, thank you for sharing what has been on your mind. Surely a lot of things. And it also aptly summarizes what we talk. As soon as we went into it, I, I just like, we went in this world of design systems and, you know, how the team works and how you work. So thank you for taking us on this journey. It surely has been a very engaging uh time with you right now and i hope to have you come back again soon with different topics to offer us to discuss and these different worlds to dive in and yeah really insightful uh, got me thinking a lot of things some questions that i actually had about design systems you know how would people be doing that this is what i do um haven't talked enough to other teams about design systems so i thought that gives me uh, some context and you know to understand it better on and gives me a different perspective and i hope the audience also gets the, their own share of perspective and yeah what do you think uh how, how was it for you and yeah i'm sure you are doing great with uh you know being out there and taking uh giving talks, being on podcasts. So I'm really glad for you. And yeah, it's been it's been a lot of fun. Thanks for going through this this big topic. Like we could go on for a long time, but I think we covered a lot of the a lot of the good areas. So thanks for facilitating and digging in. It was really fun. <laughs>